We're going to play the music. Yeah. There we go. like to uh, reconvene our meeting from last week, January 3. This is a continued meeting. Uh, we will not be taking public comment tonight. We will not be having a closed session. And we will uh, have this meeting for the sole purpose of uh, hearing from our um, Health and Human Services Compensation Study. And uh, to start off, I'll, I'll whoop, try that again. This is a continuation of our January 3, 2012 meeting. This is a, um, a uh, meeting for one purpose, and that's to, give a pre to receive a presentation on the Health and Human Services Compensation Study. We'll be taking no other business. We'll be uh, uh, not having any public comment or any closed session, and this will be our only order of business today. So we've already done our, um, our uh, invocation and pledge, and we've already talked about our conflict of interest. So let me introduce Mandy Stone, who will be telling us about the uh, study and about uh, how we came to the point we are now with this information. Ms. Stone, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Gant and Commissioners. While we're waiting for the PowerPoint to begin, I would just recognize that you have department heads in the audience, as well as division heads from Health and Human Services, and I invite you to direct questions as appropriate to them. These are the individuals that you've selected and entrust to manage our services and our resources on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll tell you that they do an outstanding job, and you'll see the data that supports that today, and encourage you when you feel like you want to hear from the individuals who are actually directing services day to day on the street to direct your questions to them. You also hear from two experts who I will introduce in a little more detail later, but we are honored to have Drake Maynard with us who um, comes to us with 30 years of experience in the offices of state personnel and state government, local government <laughs> personnel systems. And our own Lisa Eby, who I think we recognize often for her expertise in human services, but who has completed in her role as our human service manager national accreditation in human resource management as well and is recognized both across the state and nation for her expertise and I will begin by saying that Lisa recently did a webinar sponsored by the Child Welfare League of America with a thousand participants nationwide who wanted to understand how we have made such strides in our recruitment and retention in the areas of child welfare. And they have won both national um, and statewide award and recognition for those initiatives and many of the division heads are in the audience who are also a part of that. But to begin with, if the, um, we can roll the PowerPoint. I want to give just a little bit of history. 2005 is the area or the period of time when we began to recognize and prepare for unprecedented economic times. Commissioners gave us a very clear directive related to how we could build community partnerships, how we could work smarter and leaner, how we could focus on core services and do more with less to prepare for what we knew would be unprecedented growth and demand for our services. But prior to 2005, we were experiencing an unprecedented turnover rate um, and work, basically a workforce crisis. And I want to talk a little bit more in, de in detail about that on the next slide. We had turnover in areas of DSS, EMS, and the detention center as high as 39% going into those years. We had a pattern of an inability to recruit and retain fully qualified staff, a pattern of pages and pages of weekly job postings that we could not successfully fill, and months and months to fill positions. I think when you look at the impact of that revolving door from a citizen's perspective, you need to ask the question, 
how does that impact our community? And when you think specific to core county functions, you need to understand that those are legally mandated, those services that only counties in North Carolina can deliver. So first and foremost, it puts us in the compromised position of being out of compliance with legal mandates, and that creates liability, and citizens ultimately pay for those liabilities. Whether they show up in audit exceptions or lawsuits, citizens ultimately bear the weight of those. Second, turnover begets turnover, and every human resource expert in the nation will tell you that. When employees are left to carry the workload of employees who have exited our system, we, see incre we, we saw at that time increased burnout and further turnover. So that's another community impact. And the community safety net is significantly compromised when we're unable to recruit and retain fully qualified staff. It's important to note that when employees leave us, they take more than their belongings. They take our financial investment in their skills and training, and Lisa will go through later some of the detailed cost impact of that. They take institutional knowledge, talent, and experience. They take a chunk out of the morale of remaining employees who are left to carry the weight. And they take our reputation as an employer. And counties in North Carolina provide unique services that put them in the position of competing against each other for specialized training and skills. So damage to our reputation, a culture and environment where our employees question our commitment to their benefits and compensation in which they feel uncertainty creates additional stress on them. And many of them in that time were seeking jobs in other counties where they felt like they were more fairly compensated or benefited. We are, as you know, a very data-driven system on the health and human service side in the county as a whole. Significant to note that congressional study commissions have been dedicated on a national and state level to this issue because in health and human services across the nation, 61% of our workforce are baby boomers. 50% of our workforce require specialized skills that are unique to government. And it's significant to remember that there's no place else people can go for the services that we're mandated to provide. It's not like shopping Lowe's versus Home Depot. There's only one environmental health service that can tell you if your septic will perk or can respond to a disease control um, outbreak. Our workforce requires highly specialized training that can only be provided through controlled government regulated systems. Can we compete to hire a nurse? Absolutely, but that's not the right question. The right question is can we compete to hire an experienced, qualified disease control nurse who knows how to manage an outbreak? In a Congressional Study Commission, one of the quotes that I find most telling is they really call this, this upcoming workforce a crisis a tsunami, where what we will lose is turnover, institutional memory, diversity, and educational qualifications. This is an issue being studied across the nation, concern about how will we address this on a federal level, a state level, and in North Carolina, a local level. I also want to make the point about the scope of our responsibility, and again, today I'm talking from a DSS and health perspective. DSS and health directors are public officials with sworn duties and responsibilities that no other entity can assume. The quality of our employees drive the quality of our services, and when we fail to deliver quality services, it impacts the individuals and families we serve, it impacts the taxpayers who fund our services, and it impacts the community at whole who's left at risk to public health and social situations. County taxpayers fund our errors through audit paybacks and lawsuits. What you will see, scroll across the screen for just a few minutes, are all of the legal requirements and statutes assigned in North Carolina to local health and, and DSSs. DSSs and health departments carry the full responsibility for these legal mandates 24-7, 365 days of the year, 
rain, snow, blizzard, or flood. Counties are mandated to provide these services, often with specific mandates on timelines, caseload sizes, supervisory ratios, and training requirements. We don't have the option of turning people away when the load exceeds our capacity or when growth exceeds our predictions. The public has the right, to, a legal right to these services to be provided in every county in North Carolina. And we are not scrolling, but it did scroll through the whole thing. I also want to make the closing point on that um, particular slide. Let me get caught back up with scrolling. That we have to, that I have lived in the environment as a social worker, as a social work supervisor, as a program manager, as an assistant director, as, and as a DSS director, when I held in my hand a stack of CPS or APS reports with a legal mandate to assure compliance and could not hand that report off to a qualified or available staff. I've dealt with that level of responsibility at two o'clock in the morning. I've dealt with that level of responsibility often during the week. I know what it feels like to live in that world and it's a world I never want to go back to. I think it's critical to understand that we can't be willing to set priorities among legal mandates. We have to meet all of them. I also want to make the point that there's a significant, when you, w there's a significant impact, fiscal impact to the services we provide. Your local Department of Social Services Public Assistance Department administers $433 million of public benefits last year. Counties are totally responsible for the accuracy of the delivery of those benefits in terms of timeliness and error rates. Even more important, and I don't, I know that this commission recognizes this, is the human impact of our services. That, that we deliver services to vulnerable populations who depend on us for their basic care and safety, protection from public health risk and protection from harm. And I think the human factor is important to keep in mind as we move forward tonight with our study. My job, is to help our community realize a better future, to ensure the supports are there that keep individuals and families whole and keep our community strong. Our strategy, and I wanna talk a few minutes about our strategy, we stand before you tonight to present a workforce plan that was intentionally designed. It didn't happen by accident. It's been interesting to me to watch some of the media related to compensation and benefits that act surprised by it. It's been a very deliberate and open process. Management <coughs> team after management team over the years, we've talked about employee survey after employee survey, exit survey after exit survey, we've analyzed data and talked about what does it take for us to be able to recruit a fully qualified staff and retain a fully qualified staff. HR directors and HR experts across the nation agree that the only apples to apples comparison that you can make when you wanna do a salary study is a base pay. And all base pay brings you is the ability to recruit individuals in a competitive way. Specific elements of benefits lead to an apples to oranges comparison. Have we done those comparisons? Yes. If you look across the urban counties in North Carolina, they have a diverse mix of benefits. Some have merit, Buncombe doesn't. Some have longevity, Buncombe does. Some have various additional leave incentives or packages or investments in retirement or, or 401k programs, some don't. But each of these counties will tell you and did tell us that they're continually evaluating <coughs> and adjusting their package to competitively <coughs> recruit based on the current economy and the current market. Each understands they're limited in their ability to adjust their benefits to current employees. There's certain rights that we hold to current employees that pose potential legal liabilities when we look to change those. In addition to those legal liabilities, each recognize that we compete with each other for a highly specialized workforce. And when we create, un uh, create uncertainty among our employees about their own pay and benefits, we open ourselves to those employees choosing to work in other counties. 
who are recruiting against us for the most qualified and brightest employees. I think the real question for us as a county that we want to answer tonight is have we managed our public resources well? Have we developed a workforce plan that's effective and efficient for Buncombe County? And that's the focus of our presentation tonight. We do want to make the point that it's a multifaceted workforce plan. You know, it's, we can't look at it from just one single view or perspective or lens. We have to look at it broadly. We also want to talk about why we started with Health and Human Services in terms of the salary and compensation stand. First of all, Health and Human Services are mandated by law to counties in North Carolina. They're what distinguish us from municipalities. We serve both incorporated and unincorporated areas across our county, and we answer to the Office of State Personnel. That makes us unique to other services in the county. We're also the largest budget expenditure for counties, and as this board well knows, you have a legal mandate to deliver these services, and you seldom have control over how fast they grow, who they serve, or what the fiscal impact will be to you as a county board. The second aspect we looked at in rolling out forward with um, Health and Human Services first is they comprise 40% of our overall workforce. And if you move beyond Health and DSS and the Sheriff's Department, um, you have two of your largest departments sit in Health and Human Services, so they were a natural place to begin. <laughs> health and Human Services also run counter-cyclical to the economy, so they've continued to grow as the economy worsened. We've continued to have to expand staff and hire additional people and rehire for positions, so that's another reason we push forward first on this aspect of it. To look at the specific plan, I want to go back and talk about the directive commissioners gave us in 2005 and that's reflected in our current strategic plan. That was to focus on core services, to invest in smart partnerships, to deliver non-core services, to reinvest any savings to core government work, to commit to attract and hire and retain the best staff. That was a directive commissioners gave us. To lead by performance, high standards of performance and, re and results driven metrics. I wanna talk just a few minutes about a couple of um, examples around smart partnerships. To begin with, I wanna say that had we not entered those partnerships on the health and human services side since 2005, we would be talking about an additional 150 county employees. We've invested $6 million in the private and nonprofit sector through smart partnerships. Have those partnerships worked? You've heard many of these presentations before, but I'll highlight just a couple. First, the Minnie Jones Health Clinic. When we delivered primary care within the county structure, we invested $4.5 million and served 9,000 unduplicated consumers. The first year of transition, that the transition of those services cost us 2.3 million and we serve 13,248 consumers. 70% increase in the number of unduplicated adults served and that was critical to our community because we really do have capacity to serve children among our private pediatric practices and family clinics. Second example I'll give you is child care subsidy. When we outsourced, um, entered into a partnership with Southwestern around child care subsidy, we realized $323,000 in savings. Based on this commission's directive, we reinvested those in the child care, the early education system. Examples of that is we invested in workforce development for child care through a contract with AB Tech. We invested in high school graduation initiative and abuse prevention through our Valley Child Care Center. We invested in the training of providers to improve the overall county early childhood education system. And through a regional call center and a regional approach to managing subsidy dollars, we were able to maximize funding despite state and federal cuts to this area. I think lastly, the question that commissioners, ha the, the directive that commissioners um, gave to us and the, the question that we're here to answer tonight is when you told us to invest in the very best workforce, you told us to do that 
but not on the backs of taxpayers and not at the cost of services. And this graph shows you that with a declining and flat tax rate, we've continued to serve additional um, county residents and will in health and human services have, have provided services to 120,940 citizens last year. So I say that because I think it's critical when you think about have we been effective in, re in managing our workforce resources to acknowledge that we've been able to recruit and retain the brightest, experienced, fully qualified staff. We've done it without additional tax increases. We've met the additional demand in core services and we've expanded services through six million dollars worth of private smart partnerships. I'm going to turn over a lot of the detailed pieces of the presentation to Drake. I want to just quickly say about Drake that he comes to us, as I said before, with 30 years of experience in the Office of State Personnel. He also worked for 12 years in the Human Resources at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. That alone would be reason for me to have supported um, entering into a contract. A second ammo. <laughs> <laughs> um, that he was responsible at the university system for all aspects of operations, recruitment, selection, classification, and compensation, benefits, training, and development, and employee relations. When he returned to OSP in 03, he managed the team of HR generalists who specialized in services to local government, and he wrote most of the laws and administrative rules that we um, all act under today. Drake's a graduate of the University of Chapel Hill and a graduate of the school of USC's law school. I'll also quickly um, introduce Lisa, who will follow immediately after Drake to say, that those of you know Lisa and her expertise in human services, Lisa holds a Master's of Social Work from UNC Chapel Hill with a specialized focus in organizational development. She also holds a Master's in Biostatistics from the Medical School of Virginia. She's recognized both on a statewide and national level for her work in human resources and health and human services. Normally, I wouldn't bring a bottle of water up during a presentation, but I'm at the tail end of a bout of bronchitis, and so I don't want to break into coughing and turn off our TV audience. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come here this afternoon and as part of this group, talk with you about the workforce plan that Buncombe County has embarked on. Uh, there are two pieces to what I'll be talking about uh, in the next little bit. Uh, the first piece is the relationship between the human services departments, social services, public health, and the Office of State Personnel and the State Personnel Commission. As Mandy mentioned, these are, uh, this is a relationship that is special, particular to the human services departments here in the county. There isn't the same kind of relationship with other county departments. So this is, uh, that'll be the first part of what I want to talk about. The second part, I want to address uh, the whole issue of the compensation strategy, um, whether the, the uh, idea is to lag, match, or lead and markets, and more importantly, what's the market? Let me, uh, in, in talking about the relationship between the Office of State Personnel and social services and public health, let me uh, go back a number of years to the early 70s. Uh, back then, the federal government began funding these kinds of activities, and when I say these kinds of activities, I also would include mental health um, at the county and, and the regional level. When they began funding uh, or mandating these services, the funds came with a number of strings, um, as they often do. One of the strings that came with this um, mandate and the funding was that the funds 
uh, for these programs had to be administered through what is known as a merit system of personnel administration. Now, this was, as best I've been able to determine, Congress's effort to try to encourage the states to set up their own civil service programs to mirror uh, the federal civil service. Some states did that. Here in North Carolina, our legislature said, we already have our own civil service system. Um, we've got an administrative organization, the Office of State Personnel. We've got a policy body, the State Personnel Commission. So why don't we just put these activities, social services, public health, mental health, and put them under our state personnel system? And so the people in those areas, whether they work in a county, a district, or an area, they are enjoying some of the rights, the benefits, and the privileges that state employees enjoy. So that's how this started, and that, um, that has continued to the present day. Um, the Office of State Personnel is the body that on the day-to-day -day basis oversees this merit system of personnel administration at the county level. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you that, that the number of people involved in that effort has shrunk considerably. When I came to OSP and took this function over, I had 11 employees doing this work along with a few other assignments. When I retired seven years later, we were down to two people doing it full time one person doing it half time and then myself doing it whenever I could put the time in. So the resources have dwindled. That's called for, especially in the larger counties, more of an effort on their part to manage their human resources activities. What the Office of State Personnel does is uh, two things primarily, along with the Personnel Commission. Number one, the Personnel Commission has set up a series or a system for classifying jobs, and we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Um, it's the responsibility of the Office of State Personnel to administer that system of job classification in terms of county departments of social services, county departments of public health. Some of the jobs in those human services areas at the county level are considered similar to jobs at the state level and some of them are quite different because there's also some very different unique activities going on at the county level. So the Office of State Personnel um, not only says here's the types, here's the menu of jobs that are available to you, but Every time a new job is created or an existing job is changed, that change has to be reviewed and approved by the Office of State Personnel. One of the points uh, that came up this afternoon when we were getting prepared for this was that there's a, there's a certain um, limit, shall we say. These jobs that OSP has set up, if you're a county of this size, you can have one of them. If you're a county of this size, you can have three of them. But no matter how much money the county has, if you're a county of this size, you can't have 15 of them. So that's sort of a limiting uh, aspect of what the Office of State Personnel does. The other thing that they do in connection with the Personnel Commission is that every year the county is required to put forward an annual salary plan covering their human services departments. Now, um, when I first came to the Office of State Personnel, there was a big fight at every personnel commission meeting about changing county pay plans. And it basically revolved around the haves and the have-nots. 
So not long after that, the legislature changed the State Personnel Act, and that's the, the foundation of what the Office of State Personnel does and how it works with the counties. Changed it to say that counties have the authority and the responsibility to set up a pay plan according to its fiscal needs, which put, put it back on the county to say we can pay this much, we can pay this little. So what the commission focuses on, what the Office of State Personnel focuses on, <coughs> excuse me, is not how much the pay is at a particular level or for a particular job. They're more interested in monitoring the distance. And we'll get something that I think that'll, ah, here it is. Look at this, first of all, visually. If you look at this, you can see it's, it's sort of a pyramid structure. In this particular case, this is the Income Maintenance Caseworker Series. At the bottom, at the lowest salary grade level, is the Income Maintenance Caseworker 2. It's also the one with the least amount of minimum education and experience. As you go up the ladder, you see uh, greater experience, broader duties and responsibilities. Also, like a pyramid, the most employees are found at the bottom, and as you go up the pyramid, there are fewer employees. Now, let me draw your attention. Let's see if this thing works. Nope. Let me draw your attention at the bottom of each of those bars, you'll see salary grade and a number, 65, 67, 69, 71. What the Personnel Commission is interested in is that in a series like this, there's a certain distance, generally a percentage distance, between the salary, the base salary of an income maintenance caseworker two and an income maintenance caseworker three. In this case, it would be 10%. Now, does it make any difference what salary grade 65 represents? Not really, not to the commission. They're more interested that there's a specified minimum distance between these classifications. So that's, you know, that's what the commission looks at when it looks at people uh, and the salary plans that counties put in every year. Now, um, unless and until something changes, and I understand there's something in, uh, afoot in the legislature that may cause a change in that, um, right now, uh, for the foreseeable future, there is and will be an ongoing uh, partnership between the human services departments in Buncombe County and the Office of State Personnel and the State Personnel Commission. Um, I would point out that even should things change, there's still going to be, I think, some significant interplay and the need for an ongoing relationship because as I understand it, the Buncombe County personnel system has a lot of the same aspects of the state personnel system that was deliberately modeled on that. So whether there's a legal statutory relationship with OSP in Buncombe County or whether there's simply a stylistic relationship, I see that continuing into the future. Uh, let me give you an example uh, which is tied into this. Um, a number of years ago, probably about 2005, uh, Buncombe County came to the Office of State Personnel and said, we would like to try something new, different, a little bit out of the box. Um, in fact, it's so out of the box that we're going to need the State Personnel Commission to grant us an exception to their policy. So we worked with Buncombe County. The issue was turnover, and one of the solutions was something called open recruitment. That is, open recruitment says we take applications all the time for these job classifications. 
we never close. Now that actually is specifically forbidden <laughs> by the State Personnel Act to do that. Uh, and it's a long, uh, not particularly interesting story involving patronage. But nonetheless, uh, the Personnel Commission um, has the authority because they have a rule that says you cannot have this. Their rule also says in certain cases based upon uh, a good demonstration of need, we will approve open recruitment. So we looked not only at the need, but the process by which Buncombe County was going to do this, this open recruitment, and what they hoped to gain. Um, and it, there were a number of meetings. Uh, Lisa traveled to Raleigh. Uh, my staff traveled up here to Asheville. Um, in the end, it looked like a really great idea. And again, out of the box. You know, something a little new, a little different. And um, a personal failing of mine is I always like to experiment a little. And so um, we went to the Personnel Commission, and it wasn't just Buncombe County, but the Office of State Personnel. My group went to our director, said we need to support this. The director supported it. We appeared with Buncombe County at the commission meeting. They approved it. The bottom line, uh, as you can see on the screen up there, reduce the time to fill a position by 50%. Now, Director Stone talked about turnover problems. 39%, I think, was a figure I recall. A significant part of turnover is the time the job is vacant mm -hmm. from when the person leaves until somebody comes in. The second part of it is when we get the, the new person up to speed and running. And that was the second part of this, was not just re recruiting people on a continuous basis, but recruiting people that could hit the ground running, that would have a, a very short slope to get up to full speed. So this, um, I think this is a very successful aspect of what this partnership has involved and certainly a very successful aspect of this workforce plan. Um, Lisa is going to get into the specifics and the details in just a minute. Uh, five classifications that we're going to touch on this afternoon uh, would point out, uh, for example, income maintenance caseworkers, a very large portion of the social service department workforce. And then um, child welfare social workers, a difficult to recruit and retain group for a variety of reasons. Uh, public health nurses, again, a group that carries its own special challenges in recruiting and keeping those folks. So these are the, the five job classifications that we looked at. Chairman Gant, can I ask a process question? Um, yes, so, should we just hold our horses until the whole, all the presentations are complete, or? Sh um, I'd say let's go ahead and just ask as we go. Is that all right, people? Would you rather wait till the end? I'd wait till the Let's end. wait till the end. Wait till the end. It may be answered as you go along. I look forward to asking you questions whenever okay. it happens. So, it's not going to be now. You, you <laughs> ask them. I'll do my best to answer them. All right. Um, I want to spend the last piece of my time talking about compensation strategy. There are essentially three different compensation strategies. That is, uh, whether an organization uh, lags, trails behind the market, pays lower rates than the market rate. Uh, this, for example, is the compensation strategy of the state of North Carolina. And uh, if y'all want to stay here till 9, 30, 10 o'clock, I'll, I'll tell you what the problem is <laughs> no, with that. No, no, But y'all probably have other things to do. Uh, another compensation strategy, and by the way, these are not mutually exclusive. As you'll see, Buncombe County actually mixes and matches here, um, is matching the market. Uh, what does the market pay? That's what we're going to pay. 
The other one, obviously, is to be ahead of the market, determine what the market pays, and pay better than the market. So these were the strategic options open to Buncombe County. Now, the question is, what's the market? How, how do we determine what the market is? Um, for example, the state of North Carolina, um, when I came to work back in the mid-70s, their market was the southeastern states. But as time rolled on, uh, things changed. And for some things, it was the state of North Carolina. Some places, the market was southeastern states. And then for some uh, job classifications, particularly information technology, there was a national job market. Now, Buncombe County has chosen to go with uh, what the screen calls the Big Ten. Now, we had a bit of a dust up talking about what we were going to do uh, this afternoon because I made the mistake of picking the top 10 most populous counties in North Carolina. Um, but apparently the uh, Depart North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services says there's 10 urban counties. And so we differ on what is or is not in that group. But nonetheless, these are the people which um, with a couple of exceptions, they're the counties outlined in red. Now, this to me is an incredibly effective visual for talking about market. I would ask you to look at that. You'll notice uh, you've got Wake and Durham there. You've got uh, Cumberland, that's the red one there in the east. Uh, you've got Mecklenburg and Gaston. You've got Guilford and Forsyth. Um, particularly um, Mecklenburg and Gaston, if you'll notice, every county surrounding Mecklenburg and Gaston is in the 70,000 to 200,000. So Mecklenburg and Gaston are in the midst of a very large piece of North Carolina's population. If you look at Wake and Durham, you'll see the same thing. Significant numbers of counties, the yellow counties, in the 70 to 200,000 area. Now look at where we are this afternoon, Buncombe County. There's one yellow county around Buncombe, that's Henderson. Henderson is not at 200,000. My understanding is Henderson's 101,000. So if you wanna look at it, and Buncombe is what, 235? 235. So, uh, Technically, there's a yellow county there, but Buncombe really stands at the top of the pyramid here in the western part of the state in terms of population. It is one of the 10 most populous counties. I think it's number seven. Um, and there is, um, in the field of human services, I want you to recall what Director Stone said earlier. These are legally mandated services that the county must provide. Not a municipality, not the city of Asheville or the city of Black Mountain, Buncombe County. You can't shop for these, right? So when you look at a county with 235,000 population, and then you've got counties around it with 19,000, 35,000, et cetera, you're going to see a different scope uh, in the field of human services, you're going to see different complexity. You're going to see uh, just greater numbers. So, um, Buncombe County chose to align itself with the Big Ten. That is, Buncombe County chose to try to match in terms of base compensation, and particularly in the five classifications that we're looking at this afternoon, they chose to match. Our compensation strategy is to match Cumberland, Durham, Forsyth, Catawba, New Hanover, and to lead in the counties that surround. That is, the, when you lead what you do is you, that's a recruiting incentive. 
Yes, there may be a greater workload. Yes, it may be of a greater acuity. Uh, the problems may be different. Uh, they may be more complex, but we're going to pay you for that. So in the final analysis, again, Buncombe County isn't lagging any market. It, in the markets that, that I've just talked about, the surrounding area market, the Big Ten County market, there's no lag. Buncombe chose to match. That is to say, uh, we're going to try as closely as possible to pay in these hard to recruit and uh, difficult to retain classes what they pay in Wake County, what they pay in Gaston County, what they pay in Cumberland County, because those, they're looking for the same kind of people we are. And so we want to recruit those people and hopefully we can retain them. We want to lead our area where we can pay more than Henderson County or uh, Madison County. Uh, pay more, perhaps uh, get some uh, people coming in from those counties who will have the skills or be ready to step up and learn those skills here in Buncombe County. The other thing that you get when you lead the market is you, when you have um, not an entry-level job, but a job up the chain, let's say an income maintenance caseworker supervisor that's not an entry-level job, when you lead the market, your organization has the option of either promoting from within or looking outside because people are going to see that leading the market pay rate and they might be interested in coming in at that higher level. So it's something that provides more options in terms of recruitment and selection. Sometimes, obviously, you never want to just go one way or the other. You never want to limit yourself to just internal promotions, nor do you want to limit yourself to always bringing people in from the outside. You want a good mix. And it's Lisa. Do you want to, before you get going, why don't you go ahead, uh, Mr. Jones, with any questions for uh, You Mr. know, I'll, I'll be happy to wait till the end. I, I just will, I will have a lot, so I'll just, I'll wait. So okay, I look well, forward to it. Then I'll Thanks. get a chance to sit down and rest. Yeah, you rest. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I'm going to clarify one point real quickly that um, before Lisa gets up, and that's around the big 10 counties, and I think Drake made the point, but I want to clarify it, that the State Department of Health and Human Services defines our comparison counties, the urban counties. And that's because if you look beyond population, 80 to 95 percent of the workload sits in the 10 largest counties, of which Buncombe is six in North Carolina. So from the state's perspective, their risk management liability lies in those 10 counties. So I, I did want to make the point that um, it's not about picking. Okay, we've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to try and do it in a way that I can keep you guys with me, but also not put you to sleep, okay? It's always hard coming after Mandy and Drake, but I'll do my best to, to pull up the end here. Um, I wanted to just start to talk about what does it take to work for Buncombe County. Um, Buncombe County is an uh, employer that demands not only excellence and performance, but it also demands innovation and creativity. It's one of the reasons why I love working for Buncombe County. Um, we started this campaign when we were trying to recruit public health nurses, and it was, are you tough enough, are you brave enough, are you cool enough, are you smart enough, are you good enough? And it really gets down to the kind of caliber of an employee that we want. We want professionals who come in, who work like professionals, who treat our citizens with respect and dignity, and we want professionals who can do work in an ever-changing environment, embrace technological advances so that we realize efficiencies in our workforce, and to continually try and grow and develop as professionals. That's what we're aiming for with this workforce plan. The workforce plan really has just three basic components. It's our ability to attract, retain, and then most importantly, I think, create a work environment that supports high performance. If you're going to invest in, in your workforce in a way that you have a good compensation and pay 
then you better make sure they're giving you um, what they need to give you for the money that we're paying them. And we have made a very strong commitment to, to that within Buncombe County, and I'm very proud of that. To attract workers, the single most important thing that gets people to apply is your salary and benefits. That's the hook that gets them in. The reputation of the employer is also very important. And again, I think Buncombe is, you hear it over and over again in the applicants that we have, that we're known for our innovation, we're known for leading um, in um, best practice, and that people come here because they want to be a part of that. And they also mention that we have very strong benefits and salary, and that is what attracts them in. So once we've gotten them, then how to retain them? Well, the typical way that we've done that in the past is through a series of enticements. And these enticements are things that keep people, that keeps a positive pressure on them to keep them in the agency. So it's things like a good health insurance um, program. It's a wellness program. We know right now that those um, two things are very significant factors in keeping an employee in a job. A graduated longevity in Buncombe is another way of doing it, a strong 401k graduated leave accumulation. Again, these are things that put positive pressure on employees so that they think twice before they move on. And then again, how do we create this high performance workforce? One of the things that I really enjoyed helping to build within Buncombe County with the human services support team is the whole notion that what we need to do is tie what we do to positive outcomes for citizens and do that in a way that we can measure it so that we know whether or not we're meeting the targets that we need to. So if you're an income case maintenance worker, it's important to know that you can get benefits in the hands of people within 13 days instead of waiting 30 days. Those are the kind of metrics that our employees are held accountable to and we regularly review these with our employees and when an employee is not meeting standards we work to help them to get there but if they can't we move them on and I really think that's something I'm proud of in Buncombe County because we're a government institution that takes our responsibility for the taxpayer money that we use very seriously and we ensure that the workers we have are doing the jobs they need to be doing and I think that's key to our um, workforce plan. <coughs> So what we're going to talk about is given our salary and compensation, what's the return on investment? Have we realized lower turnover? Have we gotten better performance? And are our citizens, more importantly, getting better service? Turnover exacts a steep cost. It has been estimated to be anywhere from 50% to 200% of annual salary every time a person walks out the door. Mandy talked about not only is there that fiscal cost, but there's also that decrease in morale for the employees that are left behind, and then there's that quality of service. We don't want children who are being served by ch um, child welfare workers having to have one caseworker after another and another. So when we look at the fiscal cost of that, it's basically broken up into four buckets. It's separation cost, and a big factor in that is unemployment. You know, unemployment now is 99 weeks. That's a significant cost. I'm also very proud of the fact that because we track performance so carefully that we oftentimes, most oftentimes, as a matter of fact, probably at least 85 to 95 percent of the time, we win our unemployment hearings because we have the data to support the fact that the employee wasn't doing what they needed to do in their job. So we've reduced those costs. We've reduced replacement costs by outsourcing our screening um, costs, drug uh, um, screenings, criminal records. And as Drake mentioned, our time to fill a vacancy. We reduced it from over 60 days to under 30 days. Um, and then the two largest areas of turnover are training and productivity. And these are, this is where the money is. This is where the cost exists. And it's because of the specificity and the knowledge that the workers that we have for this um, workforce need in order to do their job. So program specific training can take anywhere from six months to three years. That's a long time. There's also time away from work. Um, some of the training involves actually traveling and you have to be away from your job from up to a month. And then there's a lead worker and supervisor time that's invested in that training. And then productivity, that time to take on a new caseload. How quickly can we get an em employee in and have them up to snuff in with the full caseload? The longer that drags out, the longer you also have coworkers who are having to pick up that excess work and you have extra stress and strain on the system. And then the other aspect of productivity that's very important, especially when you're talking about programs that have high dollar amounts, is oversight for errors. And in areas like um, disease control, you want to also make sure that those errors don't involve the community's health. 
So we used when we talked about, we're going to be talking a lot about um, turnover costs in this re report, and you've got all that information in there. But we used um, a model by Caliper. This model is very similar to all the other models that are out there in the literature, and I can provide you with additional information, the references in your report. But it's pretty standard. And again, it follows those four buckets that we just talked about. And again, as we said, we're going to look at these five classes. They happen to represent the lion's share of our workforce. And in addition, these five classes were all identified as the ones that we had difficulty in recruiting for. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you the salaries for the big 10 counties. I'm going to apologize ahead of time for how bad these slides are going to look because of the numbers, but I'll walk you through so that you can see them. What we have are the salary rates for a child welfare social worker, and it's across those big 10 counties. Buncombe will always be shown on the right-hand side, and it will be outlined. Um, and you can see just visually looking at that, even though you can't see the numbers, that they all seem to be in the same range. Buncombe um, social workers make $52,293 on an annual basis. Um, they uh, compare with other um, counties in a range from 41,000, basically 42,000 to 60,000, 42,000 in Gaston and 60,000 in Wake County. The next slide is going to show you the salary increases that happened as we tried to tackle high turnover rates. That's the blue line. It started back in 05. They were basically making in the high 30s and again ending up in 11 in, at $52,000 a year. The green bars represent turnover at that time, and we were ex had, as we said, a crisis in turnover. We started tracking it in 08 um, after the height of it, and at that time we had turnover that was close to 30 percent on average, but again, in specific areas there was turnover as high as 39 percent. That was in, um, actually an investigation, so those frontline workers that look at abuse and neglect. And you can see that turnover has steadily decreased. Our target for turnover is 15% or less, and that's a good number. People have lives, they move on, they have children, they go back to school, and you also want to be moving on employees who aren't performing. So we want 15% or less. In fiscal year 11, we had 15%. You can see the bump up, and I actually think that was some pent-up um, uh, turnover that hadn't occurred in the prior two years because of the downturn in the economy. So it's still within reason. But the real story, I think, and the story that I want to um, kind of pound home today is that with the increase in pay and compensation, our ability to recruit experienced workers dramatically turned around. You can see in fiscal year 2006, our ability to recruit experienced workers, we had 70% of the social workers we were bringing in did not have experience, 70%. In fiscal year 11 and starting back to 09, 100% of the workers we brought in have had experience in child welfare when we bring them from day one. So the time to get them trained up is significantly reduced. But more importantly than that, they bring the kind of judgment that you need to assess safety and risk that's vital to ensure the safety of our vulnerable citizens. I want to give you also just a quick example. These are percentages, but in um, fiscal year 06, we were hiring 18 workers without experience versus in fiscal year um, 11, we hired zero, and we only had to hire seven workers, with, and, and those seven workers had experience. This graph, and you're going to see a lot of these um, comparisons as well, this is the difference between what it costs to get a new hire up to speed, those that have experience and those that do not have experience. So the short blue bar is the cost associated with those who have experience, and it's roughly $12,000. It takes anywhere from a month to six weeks with somebody who's experienced to get them up and running and to take on that full caseload. The people who we hire with no experience, it can take uh, over $32,000 to get them up and running, um, and that's the cost associated with that. When we look at the cost avoidance by hiring experienced social workers from fiscal year 06 to 11, you see, realize the savings of about $1.2 million. That cost, I want to tell you, is just for that first year. It's the first annual cost to get them trained. But again, $1.2 million because we're able to hire those fully experienced workers. And that cost, again, doesn't speak about the um, more um, important cost that, to the people that are getting that service and getting um, experienced social workers hitting the ground and running. The last thing I want to show you here is that we track beneficial and regrettable turnover. And what do we mean by beneficial turnover? That's turnover where we've been working with an employee and they're not meeting standards. And because of that, they've chosen to leave or we've helped them to leave. <laughs> Regrettable turnover is when an employee who is meeting standards or is exceeding and walks out the door. 
Obviously, we'd like to minimize our regrettable turnover, and we'd like to maximize our beneficial turnover. I think the most important thing about the slide, because it kind of goes up and down, is that we're tracking it, that we have never lost or kept our eye off the ball about how important it is to make sure that our employees are responsible to the citizens of Buncombe County and that they're doing their jobs and doing them well and that they're hitting those performance metrics. And then does it matter um, that we have these fully qualified and seasoned workers? Well, we, we track quite a number of measures. I'm just choosing to highlight one here. The blue bars represent children in foster care. So fiscal year 2006, 465 children in Buncombe County are in foster care. And fiscal year 2011, 313 are in foster care. The purple line at the top, and those numbers are varying anywhere from 99.9 .9 to 98%, so you can see a very narrow range. That represents children that we're working with in their families where we have substantiated abuse or neglect, and because of the social worker's ability to partner with those families, to work creatively to get supports in place, and to use extended family and networks, we prevent almost between 98 and 97 percent, 98 and 99 percent of those children coming into foster care. And I mean to tell you as a social worker standing here who has had to take children into foster care, I can tell you that's a very meaningful statistic. Lucy, you don't know what the, the, the numbers were prior to We didn't track it. That was, again, as we started this whole human services support team, we began tracking those kinds of things. Or I would, but I can tell you because of the decrease in the number of children you see coming into foster care that it or would it's totally cool. yeah, 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 that it would be safe to say that it was not like I that. So, okay, so we're going to just summarize very quickly. Um, with the higher paying compensation, we were able to decrease turnover. We were able to hire experienced social workers that hit the ground running, and we've seen better outcomes for um, the citizens that we're serving. Now we're going to change gears a little bit. We're going to talk about income maintenance caseworkers. And I'm going to just throw the slide up here. And what you're seeing here is the growth in the cases or the recipients of these services. <clears throat> Excuse me, the green line represents food and nutrition cases. In 2008, we had 18,000 um, recipients, and that has grown to over um, 47, I'm sorry, 37,000 recipients in Buncombe County. Roughly one in eight people in Buncombe County are on food assistance right now. That green, sorry, <clears throat> that green line and that steep um, ascent of that line really speaks to our ability to rapidly bring in new workers to, uh, like Mandy said, it's a countercyclical trend for us, and we've got to bring workers in quickly and rapidly and get them up to speed so that we can serve our citizens. <clears throat> The blue line represents Medicaid. We've seen an increase in Medicaid as well. It's been steady, but certainly not as dramatic as food assistance. 41,000 41, people in Buncombe County are on Medicaid right now. But what I want you to notice is that blue line with the spike up, that's what we predict in the way of um, eligibility increase with the Affordable Care Act. Anywhere from 20 to 60,000 new recipients that we'll be needing to um, help make eligibility determination on starting in January of 2014. So you can't sit back. You've got to have an ongoing dynamic workforce plan in order to meet these kinds of trends, and you've got to be tracking them. Okay, the other thing I just want to underscore, and we've talked a little bit about this, is just the fiscal responsibility that these income maintenance caseworkers and their supervisors have. In Buncombe County, we estimate in fiscal year 12, we're bringing $281 million in Medicaid dollars into this community. Those dollars come into our community, and they help support the local um, physician offices and medical practices and translate into almost $500 million for our community. Food assistance, we estimate, will be bringing in about $65 million. And again, that translates into um, food service in grocery stores, convenience stores, and uh, has a multiplier effect of about $112 million impact in our community. <coughs> In addition to this fiscal dollars that these um, individuals have to manage, they also have to be responsible for any kind of audit paybacks, and they have to make sure that when they determine eligibility that there are not errors involved in that. When we look at our salaries, again, it's the same format as we did with the child welfare workers, bunk them on the far right. Our income maintenance case workers make $38,356. Uh, if we exclude Buncombe from that range, the range runs from 31500 basically to $37,000. So we're at the high end. And um, what I would say to you is that our income maintenance caseworkers, I'm going to show you data that shows that we require a lot of them. We use technology, technology in a very creative way. It means that they have to have a more advanced skill set in the way that they do that work, but it leads to tremendous business efficiencies and cost avoidance for us. 
The blue line, again, is salary increases over time. You can, again, see that it was really fiscal year 08 that we made that jump uh, we had um, in salary. And the green bars indicate turnover. The high in, uh, among income case ma maintenance workers was 15 percent. But you can see the very low turnover rates. What that means is that we have very seasoned IMCs doing these jobs. They understand that complex eligibility determination. They know that policy backwards and forwards, and so they're able to do these jobs and do it without error. Again, our ability to hire those without experience versus experience when we increase pay, again, a dramatic shift. I'm going to tell you that in fiscal year 06, we hired 12 people without experience. We had eight people with experience. Again, because we've had to hire new IMCs because of the high demand in food and nutrition services, this year we hired 17 IMCs with experience, people that walked in the door and within a month we had them up and trained versus one that we hired that did not have experience. What does that mean in terms of cost avoidance? Again, like we showed you with child welfare, it's significant. There's a $14,000 difference in the training costs for food assistance, $18,500 for family and children's Medicaid, and $22,750 for adult Medicaid, which is a very complex um, program that can require up to two years of training. So you can see almost $900,000 um, that we um, were able to save because we were able to recruit, again, those fully experienced workers. And again, that eye on performance. Are we tracking regrettable versus beneficial turnover? You'll see that we have high beneficial turnover among our income maintenance caseworkers. It's because we demand a lot of them. And some people come from some of the smaller counties, lured by our higher salary, but they're not able to perform at the speed and the pace that we have in Buncombe County. This is a really important slide, and it's kind of complicated. I was practicing this last night with my son, and he was like, Mom, you got to do a better job of explaining that one. <laughs> so I'll try. Um, what this shows is um, basically the state mandate for IMCs is 275 cases per worker. In Buncombe County, our workers carry on average 490 cases, almost double that. So how do you do that? Well, we do that through technology, and we do that through a very streamlined business process that our workers have designed, okay? When we just look at fiscal year 11, and this is food and nutrition, we have 38 IMCs who are handling that huge increase in, in caseload. The state would have recommended that we had 71 IMCs to do that same amount of work. The difference in that in terms of cost is $2.3 million. But because of the efficiencies that we have, the use of technology, and the fact that we have very low turnover and we have seasoned staff doing the work, we're able to handle this high caseload and do it without error. This shows the error rates, the QC error rates uh, in fiscal year um, 2011 for um, food and nutrition services, we rated 94%, which is well within the, um, what is expected by the state. Again, we got benefits out in 13 days. The state requires 30. We had a wait time in our lobby of 7.6 minutes, which means that people who are working part-time jobs can get back to their jobs. And again, 490 cases per worker. Family and Children's Medicaid, 100% QC rate, 26 days to get benefits versus the 45 allowed by the state, 7.8 minutes in the wait time in the lobby. So again, despite the high caseloads, we have workers who are doing their job and providing excellent service to the consumers in Buncombe County. Okay, we're going to switch gears now to the health positions, and I'm going to um, tell you that you have all this information in your packet. The trend data is very similar. There are some difference in that with the reorganization of the health center that we were able to creatively redeploy staff as we transition services out like um, primary care and um, uh, prenatal services so that our turnover in a way doesn't make as much sense because we were able to take existing employees and move them into positions where there were vacancies. So I'm going to go through this a little bit more quickly but highlight some other things I think are important. As Mandy said, we can, there are a lot of nurses in this area, we're a medical hub, but are there a lot of public health nurses that bring that public health knowledge um, and, uh, and so desperately needed, especially in areas such as disease control? And that's a harder thing to recruit for. In Buncombe County, our pay for uh, public health nurse is $56,752, and that ranges from $48,000 to $60,000. So again, we're in the middle of that mix. Um, we've had difficulty in um, recruiting for nurses, particularly when we've had, we were um, adding positions, and we oftentimes would have to repost those positions two and three times in order to get a capable nurse into those positions. Um, but it has certainly been um, much easier when we were able to redeploy those staff, as I said, through the reductions in force that we had. When we have had to hire, though, you can see, again, with that pay increase in 08, we're able to hire, hire nurses that come in with that public health experience. And then again, just to give you an estimate of that cost, 
it's a difference of about $14,000 when we hire someone with experience versus someone who comes in without experience. And again, that's training costs, and the cumulative effect of that is roughly $265,000. Uh, this is again just showing we track regrettable and beneficial turnover. Those are on very low numbers, by the way. And then I just wanted to mention that um, disease control nurses, these nurses require very specialized training. It can take, um, it's about a year in order to get it. They monitor diseases in our community, they handle the outbreaks, they educate the community, and they're on call 24 7. We recently had a vacancy in a, a disease control nurse, and we tried advertising at the lower salary, and we were not able to get the kind of robust and experienced um, applicants that we wanted, so we had to go back out and, and um, advertise at the higher salary, and we're getting ready to hire with that. So again, that's just a, a, an example of where we tried to go lower, and it didn't work. Next um, category I want to talk about are the environmental health specialists. These um, environmental health specialists take up to three years to fully train and get accredited. That's, that's a long time. Um, they are responsible, as you can see, for the backbone of the health um, of our community. They um, keep our economy going with the housing industry when they're doing well in septic permits. If you don't have um, fully trained um, environmental health specialists out doing that work, they're going to slow down our economy. They're going to be a drag on it. They also do all the restaurant inspections, food and lodging. As you know, Buncombe County is a great place to go out and eat, and so we depend on those workers. Um, and, and, and events like Bell Share, you don't want people coming here and not having those um, venues fully um, up to speed as far as the health regulations. Our environmental health specialists, again, are shown in the far side. They make 46342 and the range goes from 43000 to roughly 52000 in Gaston. We had, when I first got into this job, we had a very difficult time recruiting um, fully trained and qualified environmental health specialists. The um, increase in salary definitely helped, but I will also tell you that the housing crash helped because we've been able to um, redeploy um, environmental health specialists that we had because of the large housing boom in Buncombe into those vacant positions um, when we've um, needed to. That tracks, again, their salary increases and turnover. You can see turnover is very low. Environmental health specialists right now, because of the changes in the economy, are staying put in their jobs. But it's a, a class that we'll want to look at as the economy turns around. And again, our ability to hire those experienced workers. And the cost savings here is very significant, given how long it takes to train an environmental health specialist. It's roughly $67,000 difference for each hire. It's, it's huge. And again, you think about the fiscal impact for this community if we don't have environmental health specialists doing what they need to be doing. So the last one I want to end on is um, the nutritionist one and two positions. And these positions are in the WIC program. The WIC program has gotten um, actually more complex, but the Office of State Personnel <clears throat> hasn't reviewed um, that class since the early 1960s. Um, this class, uh, uh, we've had, I'm going to again kind of go through this quick. We pay relatively well and competitively with the other counties for a two, 40, almost 44,000, and for a one, um, almost 36,000 in Buncombe County. But we continue to see high amounts of turnover in this um, area. and. Um, it, we, it ranges, you can't read that number, and I can barely read it with my eyes here, but it's roughly between 40 and 60%. It's, it's high, okay? And it's not acceptable. And um, the reason why we see that turnover, uh, we think, oh, oh, hold on, let me, I'm getting, I'm sorry, I'm in, trying to think about time here, so I'll just slow down a little bit, is that these are young women coming into these positions. They're, they're start, they ha may be single mothers with children at home. Uh, they may be people who are hoping to go further in their career and development and they're kind of, there's a ceiling on what they can make in this position. So it really requires us to look at these positions a little bit differently and think more creatively about what can we do going forward with a workforce plan that would meet these needs. So maybe it's temporary workers, maybe it's part-time permanent positions, but we need to address this because if you look, we're able to get fully experienced workers, but they leave. Um, and again, it has a fiscal impact that we are able to get those experienced workers, but we're paying for that turnover when they're leaving. And then it's mostly regrettable turnover. These are people that are leaving that we don't want to leave. So we've got to adjust our compensation pay in, in, in the benefit package that we have in a way that will create a better work-life fit for these workers. So in summary, we're using se seasoned workers in technology and we're doing more with less and we're realizing significant cost savings to the county and I, I'm also very proud of the level of work that we do and the high performance of the employees that we have. 
With the impact on the recession, I can assure you that probably there will be pressure for higher turnover rates as we go forward, and we're going to need to adjust our strategy as that happens. Those higher level positions are going to be difficult and continue to be a challenge to fill because of the glut in the housing industry, and so people in management generally own homes, and they'll have difficulty selling them, and so that will be hard for us. I'm always excited working in Buncombe County because of the future opportunities that we have. I mean, I love my job because of the freedom I have to think creatively, to think outside the box, and to, to look forward to the future to um, tackle the kind of emerging trends that we have. Our workforce has changed. The benefit structure that I descri described to you with the, you know, uh, graduated longevity and the graduated leave and all that, that was based on the 1940s. Um, workforce where 80 percent of it was a white male who had a wife at home with 2.3 children okay and that's where that benefit package came where people stayed in the same job for a long time the next 10 years we're going to have five generations in the workplace traditionalists boomers gen x gen y and gen wired workers all of those workers are going to have different needs and different wants when it comes to benefits and it's up to us to manage that strategically we know there are going to be more women in the workforce single mothers and single fathers increasingly diversity among our latino and asian populations the research shows that they want different things in benefit packages and we're going to have a need for skilled workers who are adept at using technology we're going to need bilingual workers and we're going to need flexible workers so the question to us is how do we create the same success as we move forward that we had over the last 10 years when we were trying to deal with this tremendous um, turnover that we had? And it's going to come down to really looking at different kinds of mm -hmm. options in order to not only attract but to retain those workers. One of the interesting things that kind of came out of this study to me was, as I was studying this, I realized that turnover really isn't as big a challenge if you can hire fully experienced workers. You know, if it takes you a month to six weeks to train a worker and get them up to speed and they stay with you 18 months to two years, that's not much of an investment, right? But so I think another key as we move forward is saying, how do we attract these experienced workers? And then can we create a work environment that does entice them to stay? So I'm excited about the future. And I think we're ready to take questions if anybody has any. Good, thank you. Wonderful presentation. Thank both of you. Mr. Chairman, if, 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 if I may, can I give, give a little history yes, lesson? Yes, sir. Mr. You know, I've been around here, I guess, about 23 years, and I suffered through all this, folks. We, uh, I remember coming on, and, and we, it was, we, we couldn't hire a social worker. I made some notes, so I wouldn't miss much. Uh, jailers, but I mean, we didn't pay our jailers, and I doubt if we paid a minimum wage. I don't know how we got away with that, but the jailers didn't have any, any benefits at all. Uh, and I remember, of course, having, having had the privilege of uh, using our uh, emergency medical technology people, and you don't really appreciate those folks, and I've said this before, till you, you know, you, you have a little difficulty at home and you pass out, and you're lying in the floor and your wife's beating on you, wake up, <laughs> wake up, you know. And uh, then you, you, you sort of come to in an ambulance headed out towards our hospitals, and you hear one of them say, I got a pulse. You like them. You like them. We, uh, I understand, I see Mr. Vihan here. Jay, we had, we, didn't we have to park some ambulances or something? Speak, tell us about that. We didn't have a driver to drive our ambulances. <laughs> yeah, long about the time all this problem that you've heard from Mandy and her staff talk about, we were having problems also. There was a shortage statewide for paramedics in particular. But then uh, we started having that rotating door. We losing people to Henderson County. We lose them to Mission Hospital in particular. Commissioners come along. We raise our people a dollar, and three months later, Mission had raised theirs. Well, we couldn't just raise ours in three months. We'd have to wait till the next fiscal year. But it was a, a real problem, and we had many, many days when we could not keep all uh, nine of our trucks on the road. We just didn't have the staff to to do that and finally the benefit package came around and we instituted a career ladder which you all were very generous to let us do and it stopped that bleeding process well thank you sir thank you and i you know folks i when we when we came on our our school teachers and our, we, we did get our salaries up but our school teachers were looking at the city of Asheville, and we were losing great teachers to the city of Asheville because they had a city supplement over there Buncombe County teachers did not have a supplement. They didn't get that till uh, when we do that, boss. 
I don't know, 80, somewhere. But we, we did add a, you know, go to it, it, a little discourse with the folks that didn't think ought to pay the teachers anymore, but add a supplement to our Buncombe County teachers. That's it's equal, I think, to actual city schools now, so we don't have that, that possibility anymore. But, but Miss Weir, you need to, you want to, Miss Weir. <laughs> we talked together for 30 years as Miss Weir, so you, you were going to make a comment for me before I finish here. I, w I wanted to ask about, uh, you know, we've talked about a lot about core services, and, and I think we stressed when I first came on the commission the fact that we, we were gonna, going to deliver core services at, at the highest level we could. And, and I know from um, having grown up in a family, a, a mother who worked in the social service de services department and, and a father who was involved in county government, I, I know the stress level that they're under. What do we do as far as how do we mitigate the the burnout that our that our people might have? What, what kinds of things do we I think have? that's a really great question. There's several ways that one we measure it. We measure it through employee surveys and supervisory surveys. We measure it through onboarding. We check in with new employees at um, 30, 60, and 90 days in the onboarding process, um, and then we measure them. Our division heads periodically, at least annually, do one-on-one -on -one with individual employees to, to get a sense for how our employee base is related to turnover. But um, one thing that I'm very proud of, and the, the social work program administrators who are responsible for that are in the room, as well as Mr. Vihan, we partnered with Sheriff Duncan and Mr. Vihan to bring on board to build a resiliency team in the last year for first responders and child welfare staff now legally fit the definition as a first responder and have built the supports to ensure that we do retain those individuals and that we keep them at a place whether it's um, an, whether it's on an ambulance or responding as a sheriff deputy or a child welfare social worker so that their emotional health enables them to do the job and remain on the job. So we've built an entire system around both peer supports and professional supports, a resiliency model that's been recognized across both the state and nation. Um, and, and we're very proud of that work. Thank you for asking that question because Lisa makes a good point. We demand, Buncombe County, when I say we, the community demands a lot of their government in terms of responsiveness. This board has always demanded a lot of its workforce in terms of responsiveness to citizens and our managers demand a lot. But we also have to make, care, make sure we're taking care of that workforce. Absolutely, An another thing, uh, Ms. Dunn, while you're there. As a governing body, what, what are our rights and responsibilities to, as far as compensation and benefits are concerned to, um, to the current staff now? Um, I may let the graduate of a law school <laughs> answer that question <laughs> when you say legal responsibilities. And I know that um, Diane Jeffries is one of the <laughs> foremost experts on that in the Institute of Government and that Drake's worked with her over the years on that issue. Um, that is indeed a legal question, um, um, and I'm going to focus, at least for the time being, on human services, which is what we were talking about this afternoon, this evening. Um, there's a responsibility on the part of the Board of County Commissioners to put together a pay plan that, within those extremely broad outlines that I discussed earlier, match up the personnel commissions. Uh, dictates as to spaces, distance between particular kinds of jobs. Um, in terms of if you're thinking or looking at what do we do when, uh, do if we're thinking about uh, reducing pay, if we're talking about reducing benefits, then um, th there's a bit of a dance there. Um, some benefits you would be well advised just to leave alone. Um, the legislature found out to their uh, difficulty a number of years ago when they decided that uh, my retirement benefit would, uh, I would be subject to state taxes. And uh, a bunch of judges took that to court and we got that fixed. So there are some things like uh, 
retirement benefits that probably uh, you can always start and go prospective, but for current employees, that's the kind of thing you're better off not getting involved with. Other things, um, and I had a, a, a discussion earlier about uh, the 401k. You know, what, what can we do? Can we require a max? What can we do with that? Um, that's something that I would strongly recommend you get uh, your county attorneys involved in, you get the folks from the School of Government. That to me is in one of those gray areas where if it's done a particular way or if a court looks at it a particular way, you might run into the same problem the legislature did with adjusting retirement benefits. If it's looked at a different way, then maybe there won't be a problem. So some things um, like uh, longevity. Um, longevity pay is um, something that can be adjusted up or down. It can be extended, it can be contracted. But there, there's, uh, there's some things, again, like longevity, you, can, you clearly have the opportunity, and, and pay for that matter, to raise or lower, uh, depending on economic conditions or the particular strategy or human resources philosophy the, the commission chooses to uh, employ. Others, you, you really want to get as much legal advice as you can before you do it, and then there are others that you really would be well advised just to leave alone, not touch. Did, was that helpful? Thank you, sir. I would just note that you do have in your packet an article by Diane Jeffries at the, um, from the Institute of Government, and she talks about those benefits, which do include longevity, that are viewed as an um, inherent contract with your existing employees. So she does outline case law, both in North Carolina and across the nation, specific to those benefits. I would also tell you we asked that question of urban counties, and consistently, their approach has been that they have adjusted compensation and benefits for new employees, that, they, that, that once you create that environment of uncertainty among existing employees, that you see that impact your turnover. So that's, but that was the response we heard from the Big Ten counties, is that any adjustments they've made, they've made, as, as Drake said, moving forward with future hires that there is that, and that's something, again, that is a legal question that's answered in part through this, but there is that component, as Drake said, about the retirement system that is um, an implied or inherent contract with existing employees. Good. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm about through another second or two here. Sure, the uh, uh, folks, we, you know, commissioners, we, we're here to provide our citizens with with high quality service and we have to be fiscally responsible for that i think we built a compensation package that lets us recruit and retain quality employees and that didn't come easy it didn't come easy to it we expect them to perform at a high level and and i think our you heard it a leader to our uh, what we call them performance measures indicate that they do because they, they everybody gets those they have to turn those into us. I, to, to think that somebody won't destroy that in my 23 years almost make me want to seek this job again. But uh, the, uh, I'm not ready to do that yet. But I personally, folks, am satisfied with our county manager and her management team have done and feel like they're on top of our issues without question. I'm sure they will do what they have always done and make responsible adjustments when needed. We asked him to address the workforce crisis and deliver quality, timely service to our citizens. And it seems to me from what we heard here today, they've done that. And they've done all we've asked them to do. As far as I'm concerned, I hope then I hope the majority of this board feels the same way. I've heard about all I need to hear about it. I'm about ready to go home. Me too. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, Mr. Major. And I appreciate your uh, taking my phone call earlier. That was really helpful in trying to quickly process some, some information. So 
Um, and I appreciate you kind of working through that that article with me too. And it sounds like part of what we've got to figure out if if we do uh, delve into anything is to kind of make sure that we've got you know the understanding of vested rights. Um, it seems to be the underlying issue. And um, but I kind of, I kind of felt like that you had a little bit different interpretation of the whole longevity thing. But but we can talk about that at, at that afterwards. So but I appreciate your time. And I've got a call out to the. The author too. She's evidently on writing leave, so yeah, for a couple of months. You'll, you'll have tr I, even I have trouble getting up with Diane. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I in fact uh, talked with her briefly about the possibility of her coming mm -hmm. um, to for particularly this point, but she uh, wasn't able to do it. So. I'm sure she's a really talented person. Let's talk a little bit about the tsunami that's coming because part of what I mean and um, you know, I I get it that. We had a big, big problem, and there was incredible effort intellectually, gut-wrenchingly, and um, you know, politically to, to play some cards, and it worked, and way to go. I get that. So the question is, going forward, to me, that's how I see the question is like, we had a big problem, we corrected it, you know, now we've got another, we've got some other challenges that we need to deal with. So um, I, in part, really want to focus on going forward. And I need to have a little aside in that pay and classification study titled really drives me crazy because I think this is a fabulous presentation we've had today. And I think everybody would agree and is inspired by it, but, but that's not what this is. Um, so anyhow, I'll tell you a little bit about this tsunami that's coming and how we can best, in your, in your estimation, around health and human services, because that's, that's what we're talking about today. I'm hoping we talk about other things at another time, but um, what is it that the future workforce that we've got to deal with, and I really appreciated Lisa's summary too, is going to be looking for in terms of uh, being rewarded for performance, um, what, what in your estimation, and I'd like to hear from Ms. Eby too, but um, I'd like to get your, your two cents worth, Mr. Maynard. Certainly. Um, well, for one thing, let's, let's look at this in a historical way. When I entered the workforce in my mid-20s in 1976, there were essentially two generations in the workforce, and that was uh, the generation ahead of me and my generation. And as Lisa pointed out in one of um, her slides, the, the workforce was uh, primarily male. Uh, in some areas, certainly like in the field of education and some other, there, there was uh, more of a breakdown between men and women, but by and large, it was a largely male workforce. Um, in the intervening years to 2012, We've seen uh, five generations. We now, <coughs> excuse me, five generations in the workforce. Every one of these generations, uh, as Lisa mentioned, has a different idea of what they want from the workforce, what they want from a job, what employment means to them. To give you an example, a boomer, I'm a boomer, you ask a boomer, well, what do you do? They don't say, oh, I have model trains or I like to spend time with my, no. Uh, I work in HR with the Office of State Personnel and I do employee relations work. What, what you do is your job. Uh, Gen X people, not so much. What do you do? Oh, I like to go out on weekends and we, we hit the clubs and you know I'm, I'm really attached to whatever. So when we're talking about designing a compensation and a rewards program, you've got to look at each one of these generations and find out um, what do they value? What do they not value? What do they believe in? Let me get you next to the mic. I think that's the end oh, Okay. Good. Yeah, good. Can nobody hear me? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right. Um, so, for example, um, Boomers are content to put time in and wait their turn and pay their dues. Gen X and Gen Y, I've been here 12 months and I haven't been promoted yet. What's wrong with this organization? I, I did a good job. A, a boomer is content for their once a year 
uh, performance evaluation, and then possibly some sort of performance-based pay. Gen X and Gen Y go, look, Lisa just said I did a good job. Where's my pay raise? What these groups, for example, the, the generations behind the boomers, they're interested in career development. They're interested in job opportunities. They're, they would much prefer, from what I've read in the professional materials, they would much prefer an opportunity to attend a regional or national conference with other people in their field of work where they could network and learn about um, their field of work, possibly uh, make themselves more valuable in their own job or to other employers. Uh, they're looking for opportunities to be mentored. They're looking for opportunities to try work on a project. Uh, boomers tend to be fairly individualistic. Gen X and Gen Y, they would like to work in a group, part of a team. Teamwork is important to them. I, before I retired, I supervised a team of primarily Gen X employees. And for most of my career, when we hired somebody into my group, that was my decision. I was the manager, I was the super, it was my decision. I found, after hiring a couple people that my group didn't like, who didn't stay very long, that the better process was to involve everybody on my team in the selection to take their recommendation and take it very seriously. So the bottom line is all of these groups <coughs> are looking for different rewards, um, not necessarily financial, but you know, if you're talking about sending somebody to a conference in Chicago, New Orleans, Denver, that's costing money taking them away from their job. But still, that's the kind of thing uh, that other generations other than the boomers will find uh, good, that that will be an attractive thing to them. Lisa? Um, I actually think you did a great job answering that question. I, I, I think that the exciting part for me is understanding that as the workforce changes, people really do want different things in their benefit package. They also, we spent a lot of time talking about benefit and compensation today, but a lot of it is the work culture and environment. And again, I think that's where Buncombe has a leg up because the newer workers come in and want to work within a creative environment. They want to work within an innovative environment. It's important to them that the work they do matters. And I think that we have that as an employer. Um, I think having single mothers and single fathers in the workforce and the kind of numbers that we see now and are increasing to see create challenges for us too with the kind of traditional hierarchical bureaucratic way that we have positions and I think as we move forward we're going to have to look more creatively at that and look at ways to have permanent part-time positions and flexible job sharing and things like that that will really support families that are evolving in different ways than they have in the past. Yeah, I've, I'm wide open to thinking through how we develop the, a menu that has d that meets those different needs and, uh, and not one size fits all. So I really appreciate that. Uh, in terms of kind of performance rewards, um, Mr. Maynard, would you kind of share where your recommendation about how to reward best reward uh, performance? Because that's what we, that's what we're doing here in Buckham County is is performing. Well, um, the first thing that, that's essential when you're talking about rewarding or compensating for performance is you've got to have a, a, a very solid metrics-based way to assess performance. You've got to give people measures up front. We need this, we need this many errors, it needs to be done in this amount of time. <laughs> and then more importantly, you've got to follow up. Um, I will use a bad example here. The state of North Carolina's performance management system, the vast majority, 60, 70, 80, one year it was 93, percent of employees were either above average or outstanding. That doesn't cut it. You cannot make any kind of decision, a decision about who gets to go on a training trip, who gets to go to a conference or a seminar, 
who gets a bonus, who gets an increase in their base pay. You can't do that when everybody is above average. So the first part of that has to be a good, solid, metric-based system for assessing performance provide, and providing regular ongoing feedback. Um, Lisa's slide, our slides talked about moving on poor performers. Part of the moving on poor performers, and you heard Lisa talk about it several times, is working with people who aren't meeting the standards in the hopes that they can meet the standards, that there's some reason, something's going on that you can turn around. So when you have a system that's based with these metrics and you provide that regular ongoing feedback, then that can be a very solid system for determining whatever kind of performance-based rewards, um, extra paid time off, any of these sorts of things. Um. I'm going to respectfully disagree with you. Go right ahead. <laughs> this is why Drake and I have such a good relationship. Um, I think that um, performance based uh, is, is not a good idea. And Holly, you know I disagree on this as well, but so I'm just going to give you my two cents. Um, I think that what that does is it pits worker against worker. I think that the research shows that the most effective work environments are team environments. We know from the diversity and inclusion work that the most inclusive teams are also the highest performing teams. I think when you go to merit-based pay, you pit one worker against another because every, it's not like Wobegon, Lake Wobegon and everybody can't be above average. And so my ability to make more is going to be Im impacted by the other people on my team. And so you're competing from an indi individualistic point of view versus a team point of view. We know that the efficiencies that we've realized have come through a team process. And we also know that, as he just said, that Gen X and Gen Yers, they don't want individual, they don't want to work as individuals. They, they are geared and wired to work in teams. And so I really feel strongly that performance-based pay is not the way to go. I think that you provide a rich benefit package, you provide a good work-to-life fit, you provide things like wellness programs, you provide uh, ongoing opportunities for learning and development, which is so key to new workers and that that's the way that you reward workers, at least, and that's just my humble opinion. I, I, I definitely understand that. Um, and and so it's, it's interesting to have two very diametrically different opinions. I mean, and so we'll, you know, kind of wait, waddle through that uh, too. So, um, I think that, I, mean, I guess first of all, before I kind of ask about, um, I don't even know where we've kind of gone through it, uh, almost an hour and 40 minutes of presentation, so where to go backwards. But uh, in terms of, I'll just jump in there, at least, no, uh, who did this one? Um, Drake. So the two strategies that really nailed the reduction of, the, of um, turnover that the OSP agreed to, um, it sounds like part of it was this open enrollment and part of it was that we decided to match or lead uh, and that makes total sense to me in terms of uh, compensation is there any way of knowing like is it did they are they just so married or did one impact one more than the other or um, and do you know other counties that have have taken that on since then? Maybe that's a Lisa question, but whoever wants to jump in there, let me. Because I had no, I did not know that about that open enrollment, and that seems like a really smart thing to do. And I also didn't know that the the calculation of the turnover rate is so much about the kind of the vacancy piece that you were talking about. So let me take part of that and then turn it over to Lisa. Um, from from a conceptual standpoint, they they each stand alone. Uh, in fact, I would say of the two, the more important one is the one about whether to lag, match, or lead. That's, that's really the key uh, compensation strategic decision to be made. The business about open recruitment was more of a tactical mm -hmm. decision. Mm -hmm. That is, this is one way we can increase our pool, mm -hmm. particularly our pool of experienced applicants. Um, we're obviously going to get more applicants anyway if we're matching or leading. But this open recruitment also allows us to, to build up a catalog, if you will, 
of good quality applicants so when we have an actual vacancy, these people are there, we can get in touch with them, we can hit the ground running with that selection process. And so Thank let me you. turn that over to Lisa. Um, to my knowledge, we're the only county in North Carolina that does open recruitment. Um, we actually have some folks coming up from Forsyth County next this week, wherever we are in the week, to come in, Check it out. Um, speak with us, and, and watch um, mm -hmm. how we go about doing that. What I want to say is that's that's actually a much larger question. Along with the open recruitment, we also start an intensive focus on finding workers that were a good fit for the work that was required of them. So we interview workers, um, applicants. It takes a three-hour process. They see a realistic job preview. We go through intensive questioning that's behavioral-based competency questioning. We actually give them a case and we ask them to ask us questions so we can assess their uh, risk and assessment skills. And then we have them do a written summary. And the whole hope of all that is that we have people that are a good fit for child welfare um, programs because a lot of people come and see that uh, see a higher salary and they say oh yeah I want that job but can they do the work Can they knock on a door when they don't know what's behind the door right. and that also goes back to Commissioner Peterson's question to director stone about burnout because when you put these people through this process particularly I was incredibly impressed with that here is what it means to be a social worker and it was not all puppies and kittens let me assure you. So when you're weeding out people who, as Lisa says, oh, wow, that's a higher salary, I want that job. When you're getting people who are really a better fit for the job, you're also down the road dialing down the possibility and the level of burnout. Great. Chairman, I'm going to, I've got a bunch of other questions, but I'm going to not do that in this. I'm going to make some comments. But Lisa, I'd love to get with you about the backup data for this too. I'd love to see some of the other things that you had found and, you know, kind of comparisons of the kind of how the, the yearly trends that we've seen gone down and how they would track with the Big Ten as well. Because my sense is we've done a fantastic job primarily because of all the presentation that we've seen today but there's also a factor in there of just how the economy has gone to and people are staying around longer so how we can really measure the awesome you know result that is that we are benefiting from and that citizens are benefiting from because that's that's what's really important too um, so a few uh, I guess the first question I have is a big process question maybe this is to uh, manager green um, are, are we gonna get more data on um, is, it, is there is this like part one and we're going to have more what's what's the process for this I think that is going to be the pleasure of the board and I hear mixed directions in terms of what how we'd like to go forward I, I heard that two commissioners say that they had they had heard enough at that um, and felt like they had the information they needed so it's up to the board to, to give me further direction that's good to know um okay so that's what we'll either decide to do or not to do um i guess when this whole conversation well first of all a uh, couple of things i'm just going to you know put out there that if we don't go forward with any more study that i hope we get done i hope we will fix our policy that does not recruit well when you have to have a six month waiting period for health insurance that is wrong it's been wrong and don't tell me it's a recruiting tool because it's not uh, we're going to be forced to go to three months, thank gosh, because the federal government tells us to, but that is not a recruitment tool. That is pitiful. I want to apologize to, um, I guess, to, the, to the, the department leaders for me raising my hand when um, we froze, we, well, we said we would only hire people at entry-level pay last year in the budget and I did not ask enough questions about that because I did not understand the nuance of what that meant to attract EMS workers folks those skilled people in, in public health that we need that we had to go back and re-advertise for I was part of that I voted to freeze entry-level salary and I now know that was a bad bad message so I hope we can undo that as a board too so that's another thing I'm worried about the other thing that I'm in I, I would like to see addressed is the uh, and I, I understand it from the article about the the vested rights and whatever but I am very uncomfortable with and have played a small part in this with my votes too 
the, the two-tiered system that is happening within the employee base in the sense that if you're hired after a certain date, you get this, you have the opportunity to have this level of health insurance, and if you're afterwards, you only get these options. And to, to make it even worse, we call the limited options the pay up or the, the buy up, when you're not really even being able to buy up. So that doesn't sit well with me either. And, and I'm, I'm not familiar with any other entity that has the two-tiered health system. That doesn't seem fair. That doesn't seem like a very good recruitment tool. Also, you know, we also have two different longevity systems. I get it in terms of the, but that's not a vested thing either. So where we have to protect our taxpayers and our county around vestments, we, let's do it right. But to kind of create this two-tiered system in a time when people are so hungry for work and, and want to do well, it just doesn't seem fair to me. So uh, those are some things that I hope that if we don't even, if we don't talk about this anymore, that we can at least try to, try to address, as well as develop a, you know, celebrate the, the milestones that we've reached. And I feel like we've done a great job of that today. But what about going forward? Um, and I, if we don't do any further study, I'll be happy to make my little boxes and figure out, you know, to, to, for me to, I mean, figure out, try, so I can feel comfortable that we are in the right ballpark about things. And I, it makes me so irritated to feel like asking questions somehow means I'm going to, I'm trying to destroy a system or undermines the employees. It's like, I'm asking questions. That's what I'm doing. And I'm going to keep on asking questions. That's what I was elected to do, in my humble opinion. So those, in the, in the event that this might be the last time we talk about it, those are my things that I'm going to continue to bring up and hopefully we can address and make the Buncombe County workforce a, a fairer place to work. I would like to address a couple of those things. We did, in the course of the budget, say we would uh, wanted to recruit first at entry level. Where we were not have been, when we've not been able to recruit, we've gone immediately back out and recruited at a more competitive salary so that we can hire the people that we need to hire. And I think that's worked well for our departments. Uh, and we've made those adjustments very, very quickly. Most of the counties have a two-tiered system. Uh, in, in times when things were going a lot better and people wanted to see uh, some reduction in the benefits. Uh, most counties have gone to a two-tiered system, whether it's longevity or, or vacation or, or in several of the benefits that you have. So you'll find that you'll find that up and in our municipalities too. So you'll you'll see that that as a practice that, as if you follow the Jeffries uh, uh, advice, that's the best way you can uh, start to deal with some of the costs going forward. And as we put benefit packages together, I think that's what. In new employees are going to want to see. I don't want to leave out any of the questions that you have. We do have stress in our workforce. They do feel like their benefit packages are being threatened. That is concerning. We have 1,400 employees and they do feel like their benefits are threatened. It makes it hard to keep morale up and keep people working and focused when we ask them to deliver it well over 100 percent, to do it with great compassion and diplomacy and care for our citizens, and they love the work that they do. They absolutely love the work that they do. And I'm proud of them. I'm proud of the packages we've put together, how we've changed them going forward. And there, there are areas that we will always look at. We look at them all the time as a management team to see what we need to do, how we need to make adjustments, what's important to our workforce, and we're in touch with our workforce. So I, I do appreciate all that um, Human Services has done. I think the results that you see are, are just phenomenal, how we care for the citizens and what we've done for them. I love what we do. I love being able to serve this community. And um, I think our whole workforce does. And I appreciate the benefits for, on their behalf. I, uh, this is real emotional for me. But uh, thank you for having supported the workforce. And, and I'd love for them to be able to feel confident that they can <coughs> depend on the benefit package that they have and get back focused on, completely focused on work. And um, I'm sorry if that's upsetting to anybody, but we really have a great workforce that delivers for our citizens. And they deliver for them every day. Amen. 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 I am. Um, I got a little emotional at the beginning of this whole thing when, when I heard um, Mandy. Um, talk about her experience with work with Buncombe County and then I looked out at this great group here today 
and I think that I could probably go across this room and have a personal story with everyone who's sitting out there and the great work that they do and I know you get up every morning to serve the citizens of Buncombe County and if you think that there is any if you think that there's the remote possibility that there's going to be anything that that you are going to be um, hurt in any way by this commissioner or I think by the majority of the commissioners sitting here as far as your um, compensation package, your benefits, your work conditions, anything along that line, I want you to leave here today and I want you to spread the word that in this commissioner's opinion that is not going to happen. Um, I'm proud every day of the folks who work here in Buncombe County and the work that you do and the stress that you come over and the folks that you have to deliver for and it, it absolutely well, it breaks my heart to think that there is anyone who does not realize the value with which you are held by the citizens here, the commissioners here. Um, I got over my little bit of emotion to begin with, had to borrow a Kleenex from, from Donna, but I want you to know how much we, the majority of us, appreciate what you do. We, there are no plans by the majority of us to do anything to, um, to dilute the compensation package that you get. And um, I appreciate every day the employees of Buncombe County. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I move we adjourn. Second. I made a motion to adjourn. Is there any discussion? I just need to understand, are we going to have, are we going to get that data? I mean, you referred to at the, at the podium that if you look at other counties within the, this, we can understand it. Are we going to get that at ever, at any place or? I, I think Lisa has said that she'll make all of it available that she has. You want to? Uh, and what about wait, wait. for the whole, Lisa has the help. Call the question, search. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Call the question. We vote on the question, or I. Well, if there's uh, if there's a motion on the table, unless it's withdrawn, there's no any other motion is out of order, per rule. Okay. All right. Then there's a motion to adjourn, um, without further discussion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. 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 The motion carries three to two. We're adjourned. Oop.